So, let me try and see how many of you have been with us through the whole labs experience before. Try to kind of, yeah, there's some people over there, and there's some people over here, and some people over there. Are you scared? <laughs> so, um, if you actually think of what we did in 2016, we did the first week-long labs and we brought Victoria Modesto into the room and then um, it resulted in her training herself to control the color of her dress through neurofeedback sensors and performing with, with those um, and several other things that happened simultaneously. In, then in 2017 we took it to Helsinki um, we had wonderful singer Vika Kaninen from the Sibelius Institute and um, we did something really, some really simple things with her. You know, she said, "Well, when I sing, and she sings anything from classical and folk to all the way through to um, really hardcore and fantastic vocal exercises, sort of vocal effects." Um, and she said, "Well, I, I don't know how people feel when I sing because I can't see them. I don't know their reaction, so I can't react to it myself." So the simplest thing was to wire the audience with pulse sensors and then transmit the heartbeat from the audience to her so that she could actually respond. So that was actually the simple exercise, but actually, weirdly enough, you know, sometimes some of these very simple interventions have a massive effect. And we had an audience full of um, people who were attending Slush at the opening night, at the VIP night, and we expected these kind of investors and startup y types to be into networking and not being really interested in what's on stage. But it turned into this absolutely like when we asked for volunteers to come on stage and be, fit, be fitted with pulse sensors, there was a rush for the stage. We had to turn people down. It was just bizarre. And then there was this kind of concert moment where everybody was holding up mobile phones because what we were doing was um, telling them what was actually happening, um, who was, which part of the both science and art band on stage was communicating to, to whom. On the second day of the lab already, um, our guys, our neurofeedback guys, where are you? Where are you Chico and Luis? Oh, over there, over there, over there. They were trying to train everybody to play this musical instrument which they created based on clinical trials where for people for anxiety you create a visualization of their neurofeedback so that you can recognize when the pattern of your brain changes and then you can start to train to control it and instead of that they fitted it with a musical scale and by training you could start to control the musical scale and there were people in the room who were trying that for about a couple of hours to focus and to try and move the scale up and down. And it was like, you know, it's hard work to try and train your brain to do that. But actually, I'm saying they, tra they trained for two hours and then they, were, they, were able to, they were able to do something after two hours. So that's actually how plastic we are as human beings. That's actually quite remarkable. I mean, you say it's hard, but it was only two hours. But then Rika put it on her head and she was able to play instantly. And then their jaw dropped, right, Chico? He just went, I've never seen this before. Luis went, what, what's going on? You know, it's like absolutely unbelievable. How can this person, who in the so-called mechanical era was considered less able-bodied, is now in our current, whatever you might want to call our era, far more able-bodied, especially when it comes to brain computer interfaces than the rest of us. So this was on the second day of the lab. <laughs> I'm not promising any, any, any of these kind of moments now. But it's my job, it's my job to shake you up, to take you further. You've, you've heard amazingly inspiring, incredible people. You're going to hear more of these kind of brains bouncing around in the next few days. And I'm sure that things are going to be... Oh, why am I wearing the headphones, by the way? Dean? I've kind of got into... Whoopsie. Not doing a Madonna, so let's put it there. So it's my job to shake you up. So the first thing I'm going to do, is seeing that Aaron has uh, set, set the precedent to bit participatory things, I'm going to ask you all. You don't have to tell me, but you just think of 
your earliest memory. We're just going to do that. It's something very, very simple I want you to do. Just think of your earliest memory. And I want you to spend a minute focusing, you know, like we were just talking about focus. And think about what it is about this memory that stays with you. Is it the um, sound? Is it the color? Is it people's voices? Is it smell? Some people remember um, their memory gets evoked when they smell a particular sort of grandma's baking or something like that. And take a minute and try and do that. And are you all able to evoke something? Right. Did you get there? Yes? Yes. Yes. So, I'm going to tell you something very simple. You were never there. <laughs> There's not a single, single bit of you that was there. You weren't there. What you are now was not there. So, the thing is that if you imagine, you know, like you have clouds that hang on tops of mountains. They don't really hang, right? I mean, it's hot air that raises, raises up, loops, cools, goes back down. It's a bit of a phenomenon, and we call it an entity. We give it a name. And it's kind of what you are at this very moment. And it's one I pre cooked earlier, just because I wanted to look at this space in between of transitions of things that are not one or the other. And I want to, you know, we, we do talk, when it comes to the big festival and the public facing festival, we are talking about radical inclusion, we are talking about sort of um, not having boundaries between sort of color and gender and all these kinds of things. And I think that's pretty obvious for you. I think I'm preaching to the converted here. And I think you know all of these things. But what's really interesting, I think, is that when you look at that space between nothing and the hole on the other side. There's quite a big space between the two. And that space you can divide as many times as you like. It's an interesting space. It's neither nothing nor the hole. In fact, it's full of possibility. In fact, it has infinite possibility. There's an infinity between zero and one. And if I go back to our transitions, what's really interesting is that it's neither one nor the other. There are so many possibilities in between. And I bet you anything that each one of you is latching on to particular instances in between and picking up particular combinations as more salient to you than others. So that's another very interesting idea that between nothing and the whole, there is a whole range of possibilities and you will respond to some of them. It's kind of interesting when we start to program systems. You're talking fuzzy. If those of you who know fuzzy logic, we're talking fuzzy. We're talking fuzzy from, on, in many levels, not just mathematically, we're talking fuzzy philosophically. That's why I want to, want to push you to think about this. Because I don't think we need to talk binary anymore. I think that's really, you know, this is the Platonian archetype, this is the whole, this is the one. But it may not be useful to have information about the one, the whole. There may be, it may be much more useful, in a very simple example, if you want to protect the one, the subject, what you will do is obscure the subject and draw a radius around it, so that you can still capture the data, but hide the subject. And this radius you draw is actually really interesting. It's, there's an art in drawing the radius. Because if you draw it too close, you're still exposing the subject. There's too much information about the subject. If you draw it too wide, it becomes too generic, and the data becomes meaningless. So there's an art in how you draw radius. And in the crisis, you have to draw subject. So we've got What's really interesting is that, that there is a, there is a um, value, though, 
for the receiver of this information. The receiver of this information is actually seeing something that's perhaps more meaningful to them than the subject itself. And why is that? I've got a bunch of Rob Bourgeois people there in the room, they're going to go, CONTEXT! <laughs> Yay! Right, so we've got, because what we're doing is we're getting the data about something that's placed in a context. And the context is ever-changing, and the context can be influenced by a whole bunch of different environmental or other kinds of parameters. And so perhaps if we are artful with our radius, we can convey a great deal more about the subject if we are fuzzy. But what's interesting is, you know, so this is, as I say, it's called officially classification in security. And um, I have someone in the room who was with me in the room when we were reviewing classification. And my penny dropped at that point. So he's responsible too. He knows who he is. Um, so this is what I mean, is that we are actually adding value to the subject when we do draw this radius around them. And what we're doing by pushing at the boundaries, but we're not, we're not falling over the edge, we're not going into the unknown, we're not going into the meaningless. We are staying with the meaning of the subject, but with enriched meaning. And once you start to add a description that's broader to a subject, you create a new whole. And you can do that, you can develop narratives of infinitum like this, you can duplicate this kind of thing. This is called abductive reasoning. Now, the reason why abductive reasoning is, is, is really important is because it's responsible for some of the greatest scientific discoveries. For abductive reasoning, you actually need to take a leap. You're actually looking at your evidence, and you're going to be thinking of the most plausible explanation. And the most plausible explanation requires a little bit of imagination as to what might have happened, and this imagination is guided by a whole bunch of stuff. So, put it this way. If a bunch of scientists in one particular field were just following deduction, deductive reasoning, then all of them would come up with the same discovery at once. No one would need to take the lead. But usually what happens is that two guys in two different parts of the planet, don't ask me why, but usually it's like that. It's like two discoveries of two different ends of the planet that happen at the same time. And those two guys had some other insight they added to the information and they took a leap and they created a hypothesis. And this is where, this is where science, this is where the greatness of science happens by using it creatively. So when we say that, you know, reason, you know, science is reasonable and it's certain and creativity is whimsical and unaccountable. Uh -uh. <laughs> creativity is incredibly important for that creative leap. And I had to I had to get Matin Matin Nicole's beautiful, beautiful photograph. For, because this is about moonshots. And if we're going to do moonshots, this is such a beautiful image. I absolutely love this. When did you print it? Three days ago? No, I, I got it. Please. You've got it? So she 3D printed the moon three days ago. It is I so did. stunning. Somebody else did it, but now you have the real one. I'm going to do Yorick now. Do it, yes. Yorick with the moon. How beautiful is this? We're doing moonshots. And we're doing moonshots because we're qualified to do that. This crowd here is qualified to do moonshots. I better not. It's beautiful. And um, yeah, I've just got an old shot of one my old piece of work that we now own a pattern for. But at that time, we didn't know how to describe it. It was really difficult to get a pattern for this because we didn't know how to describe it at the time. But basically, back in the day when everybody was doing music matching and similarity exactly according to, you know, X plus Y plus Z, we decided that A, music was a cultural construct, B, we needed to identify the smallest cultural unit of music, and C, we needed to fuzzify it because then we caught the response, and it was just so. 
so that people started to apply their narrative onto what they heard. And we did get the patent eventually, but um, it, was, it was tough. So pushing at the boundaries of the edges of this um, radius, what's wonderful about it is that you cannot be creative and take creative leaps unless you believe in infinity as something that is real, not a virtual notion, but real. Because every time you take a leap, you take one step forward. And if you didn't believe that there was an infinite possibility, you would not be able to do it. It's called creative repetition, or as Alain Badiou, a French philosopher, calls it encore. How appropriate. So, I'm gonna, I always, I always put a picture of Chico just because he's so handsome. <laughs> he's everywhere, he's up in up. Um, so, by recapturing him here, it's a moment, it's a fleeting moment when we're capturing his information and as it's much more interesting when he, tra when he trains to interact with the system. And it's this system that we want to interact with, not the ones outside, this system. So, I wish you all uh, best of luck during this week. You're not, you can fail, you're allowed to fail, you can, you're allowed to do nothing. You're allowed to just get annoyed and walk out. You're allowed to do whatever you want. <laughs> but in true sort of artistic, uh, we say break a leg in England, we say uh, in bocca al lupo in Italian, which means into the mouth of the wolf. <laughs> and, um, and then, uh, but, but for the sake of creative repetition, I would say toy toy toy. Thank <laughs> you.